Yeah, it reminds you don't have the second one. <laughs> Sunglasses. All right, thank you, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I'm Jeff Dickey. I'm Chief Innovation Officer at, at Redapt, and we've got a, a great panel for you today. Um, I'm going to start just kind of down the line, let everyone introduce themselves. Go, Dan. Good morning, my name is Dan Sperling with Getty Images. Uh, Getty, for those of you who don't know, uh, is in the business of imagery. We, uh, it, now that you've heard about it, it's kind of like the used car or that you buy and you start seeing everywhere on the road. It doesn't have to be used, it could be new. You see them the same, same amount. Uh, but uh, uh, we, we do a lot of editorial imagery, so the imagery out of uh, Africa around Ebola or the imagery from the Cannes Film Festival or the imagery from uh, our American version of football. Uh, I am the VP of uh, tech services there, manage our uh, basically everything outside of dev for Getty. So all the classic infrastructure, core IT, as well as uh, cloud platforms and application support. Good morning. I'm Mark Williams. I'm the CTO for Redapt. Redapt is a systems integrator that helps out customers who are building out data center infrastructure. Uh, prior to that, I used to be a Redapt customer in my prior, prior, uh, prior life at Zynga, where I was responsible. I basically had Dan's job at, at Zynga, where I was responsible for all of the game infrastructure, which originally started in traditional data centers, exploded into Amazon, and ultimately res, uh, was architected back into a private cloud we called ZCloud. Um, I'm Sebastian Seidel. I'm the founder and CEO of Scaler. Scaler does policy and governance uh, over multiple clouds. Uh, and we help uh, lots of very large uh, web scale companies run their production infrastructure. Hi, uh, I'm Shen Liang. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Rancher Labs. Uh, we, uh, we, we make a Docker management system that can run on OpenStack. Uh, uh, the other reason I'm here is um, in my previous company, Cloud.com, uh, I was involved in a lot of uh, early uh, cloud build-outs. Uh, we created a software piece of software called CloudStack, which some of you probably know. And uh, we were also, Cloud.com was also an early member of OpenStack community. Yeah, thank you guys. So we're going to talk about large scale pr pr you know, um, production infrastructure. And I, I was kind of laughing because I, I don't know if we want to talk about large scale test and dev infrastructure <laughs> instead. Or, but you know, we, everyone here has, has not only built one kind of hyperscale uh, cloud, but, but has re been responsible or integral in, in many of these. So uh, it's great to have you guys. Thank you so much. Um, I just kind of want to start out and, and just, you know, wh what, what is large? What does that mean? And, and how do you define that? Like, what's, what's, what's a large scale to you guys? Shen, do you want to start with that yeah. one? So uh, I, think, I think to me, um, you know, large is, is really has many aspects. We have people, uh, you know, I, I work with uh, uh, customers and users who built very large systems, but with a with you know with with, with a small number of uh, multi tenancy meaning you know they probably have a small handful of apps, but each app was scaled to a to to a very large number of nodes or physical nodes or virtual machines. So that I would consider that uh, you know by by whatever your definition of large is, I think I think that that is that is one form of a of large scale production system. Another form that we've seen is with service providers in a multi-tenant system, even though majority of their uh, uh, users are, don't really necessarily have a lot of virtual machines or resources in the cloud, but overall it does still amount to a very large scale deployment. I'll, I'll give a, a different perspective as well. So certainly there's the quantity number, as, as Shen mentioned. You know, certainly when you're talking about a megawatt or more of physical infrastructure, you know, a power drawn by physical infrastructure, that's one dimension. We kind of talked about this a little bit in one of the yesterday's panels too. Another dimension to look at large scale is just how much change is happening per unit of time. And when that grows you know, to, to numbers that are, exceed the capacity of, of a small number of humans, you have to be investing in religiously doing automation. So that's just another way to look at it. Um, I think a good heuristic is basically when you start p talking about power in general, when you start worrying about power, then that's kind of when you've hit that, uh, that scale. And is that in, in important? I know there's, there's, there's a lot of like tech cred involved in these large scale infrastructures and, you know, we're always talking about large and being efficient and automating, but what is, you know, what is, what is most important about that? Like, can you have a small infrastructure that's where you have operational efficiency? Like, what, what are the, 
like the what's the goal that you want to have, and and why is it so important that we talk about these large scale infrastructures? Is it is it the change of of the application? Is it the change of infrastructure hardware? What is that? Well, one one way to look at it is what's important to the business, right? So, you know, at, at Zynga. Zynga was very good at defining top-level company objectives and ensuring that every organization, whether on the development side for games or whether on the infrastructure side for operations, that everybody's objectives tied logically to the, to the top of the curve. And so what we focused on in operations was that triad of good, fast, or cheap. Pick two. Usually you can only pick two. And during growth phases, the two you pick are fast and good because, you know, assuming, assuming you're making money, it's worth kind of pouring that money into something that, that works really well and is, is there and, and, and there quickly for, for those that are consuming it. As you kind of reach a maturity curve and, and beginning to be able to optimize, you can start looking more at cheap. And what, what's difficult at that point in time is if everybody else is on a different page, if everybody else is like fast and good and they don't care about cheap and you're the operations person who's being pressured by the CFO to, to dial that number back down, you've got to get those objectives changed for your customer so that they, they care. Otherwise, they're never going to move in. In fact, this is what happened. I built Z Cloud. Uh, you know, it was aligned with the CFO to invest all that money, and then all my tenants and Amazon didn't want to move. Like, I couldn't get anybody to be the first willing participant until we had alignment of objectives where that game studio or all game studios were actually rewarded for profitability because of chargeback. So that's another strategy to kind of get, get alignment there. So I want to take a kind of an audience question real quick. But first, in that scale size, can, like, Sebastian, can you, what, what is... What's, what's a number? Can you give us a number of some of the stuff that you're working with? Um, <clears throat> some, um, yeah, so uh, one of our largest cu customers uh, it runs a multiple data center cloud stack. Um, they've, they're now at, uh, I think, 40,000 40, physical servers. Um, uh, they also have a very large presence on, on Amazon and, and some, other, some other cloud providers. Um, it didn't start that big. Uh, basically, they started on Amazon and repatriated some workloads. Um, I think the, the 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 point in time where they started talking about you know about scale and and kind of hit that inflection point was um, when yeah basically when when power when, when they started talking about the amount of power available in the in the data center and uh, and and all that. Yeah. yeah. What well, are there any questions from the audience or, or what? Why are you guys here and wanted to hear this? Are you guys trying to scale out infrastructure? Just curious about what scale is and any any questions so far? Is everyone still? Yeah, it is still early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> still sleep in there. Day four. What about my planted questions? Any of those? I got a, I got a question on scale. Um, how much did you guys scale an individual OpenStack cluster, if you will, versus? going to multiple clusters instead? So my experience prior was with CloudStack, which I'll give you those scale numbers and I'll give you my opinion on what I see happening or struggling with OpenStack scaling. So with CloudStack, and this was Shen and, and Zynga working together in the early days, we scaled our first availability zone, or sorry, our first region to 12,000 physical nodes with three management servers. And then we had a second region that was uh, 30,000 nodes, also with three management servers. So it's been acutely frustrating for me to kind of hear all of the pain at summit after summit about how difficult it is to get OpenStack to reliably scale. And so, you know, with standard OVS, the number I keep hearing is 50. With, you know, some uh, more advanced networking topologies or, you know, you know using direct, um, uh, direct networks, I, see, I hear the number between 100 striving for 200, and I, I just keep shaking my head. This summit, I've learned more about cells, where you can kind of chain together several 100 to 200 node, uh, you know, Nova API clusters, but still there are major deficiencies with how well that's federated across, and there's known kind of significant limitations. It's still considered experimental. That said, there, were, you know, cloud scaling was one of our earliest partners at Redapt, where they had designed 
an, an OpenStack and a, specifically a network architecture that could scale. And I know that you know, their, their biggest claim to fame was 22 racks for Walmart. That was probably, if I assume 22 nodes per rack, you know, in the 400s and built to go beyond that. And that was very much an Amazon-like architecture. And the reason it was so different, and the reason I liked it, is because it's very utilitarian. Like, they took all of the complexity that is OpenStack and the far-reaching bits, and they said, no, we need to make compute scale, we need to make storage scale, we need to make the networking scale. And making those simplifications to their stack made that possible. And so what I fear with OpenStack is all of that heavy complexity, the intent to uh, integrate with so many different proprietary platforms because that's what customers are also asking for, but those pieces are more fragile. Those pieces um, have more complexity in them and, and complexity doesn't scale, at least at this stage of the uh, maturity game. Yeah, I, I'm expanding on that thought. I think that we all agree that complexity doesn't scale, which is why every time you talk about scale, you talk about consistency and simplicity. So totally agree on that, that point. Uh, kind of answering the question you didn't ask though, uh, and, and associated is I, from, from a Getty perspective, we are looking at it as a management versus scale problem. So from the standpoint of does it scale enough? So if you talk about 200 nodes, is 200 is a, uh, nodes enough for a region, for an availability zone, whatever you want to call your pod? Uh, and you then balance that with how much management overhead that takes to manage that kind of environment. Uh, for us, as we start to look more at hardware isolation capabilities and environment isolation, given some of the fragility of moving OpenStack into production, we have intentionally broken those apart in, in data center, not even across data centers, so that we have uh, the ability to withstand like physical hardware fails of a, at a massive scale, not just at a onesie twosie level, and not have massive application impact. So we are intentionally breaking stuff apart into local AZs uh, and then geo AZs, which is, which is indirectly, uh, from a, answering your question perspective, indirectly uh, addressing the challenges with scale, specifically with OpenStack. And then also, I, I'll touch on the one other thing. Like we also looked at some of the challenges uh, with some of the modules that were uh, more uh, impacted by scale problems, and we've gone with some proprietary solutions to meet those challenges. No, so I want to just um, uh, emphasize actually a point uh, Mar Mark made. I mean, really, I don't think there's any, from my perspective, whether it's OpenStack or CloudStack, there really isn't a, uh, uh, it's a little confusing to, think about an absolute you know, scalability limit because it really has a lot to do with how you configure uh, your system. Uh, imagine if you have shared storage and not only shared storage, say it had to be fiber channel storage or iSCSI storage. So the, a lot of these things come with some inherent scalability limits, right? And same with networking or you know, other parts of the infrastructure. Uh, uh, but there's a, I'm, I'm actually f quite encouraged, uh, at least recently with the with the success of, a, uh, of services like DigitalOcean, you know, such a simple service, yet you know, gaining tremendous amount of adoption. And I saw, uh, you know, a few months ago, I signed up for a beta service. I think it's an OpenStack implementation from GoDaddy, which you know, honestly looked quite similar to, to, um, uh, to DigitalOcean. I, I think they have some very capable people. I, I would assume they, they solve some scalability problems as well. So I, I'm actually, uh, quite hopeful if we can uh, you know, maybe move toward more uh, simplified infrastructure, because the world is changing. You know, it's, it's just very difficult to try to carry forward the traditional legacy uh, shared storage you know, of uh, layer two, you know, fancy layer two networking, yet still make it scale, versus today, if you, you, know, if you look at DigitalOcean, uh, by making the infrastructure layer simple, but bringing uh, some of the complexity up, up to a layer above the infrastructure, you know, like, like platform as a service or Docker containers, right? Those things are just better designed to, uh, to scale at, 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 and, 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 and introduce the complexity at different levels. So I think, you know, for many of you, uh, des if you're designing and architecting a, a system that you really want to scale, I mean, really, I would suggest we should all focus on making it simpler. Um, yeah. Uh, I've seen a lot of customers uh, struggle just to get beyond 20 physical nodes uh, when when you're using Neutron, when you're using you know, a bunch of you know, bunch of components like that. So it's so you you hit into a wall pretty fast uh, when you start using uh, off-the-shelf stuff. And, and going back to that kind of is it important and and do we need that for the masses? I mean, there's only so many people that are going to scale 
to 50 and 100,000 physical nodes. Is it important for the, the physical environment to scale, the cloud platform to scale, or the apps to scale? Like, what, what are we trying to achieve? I think that it comes back again to that conversation around uh, management ver overhead versus scale. If 50 to, to 100,000 nodes, yeah, sure, that's not going to be very common. But 20 nodes, like that, that's every single day. Uh, so from that standpoint, if you if you you know multiply out, you need 200 nodes, and all of a sudden you've got 10 environments you have to manage. You multiply it out to 2,000, you have 100. Like that's that becomes a management nightmare. And the whole point that Mark made around what is scale? Scale is that point at which you know power for sure is a point, but also which people doing things the way we historically have done them just does not work anymore. So if you're going to say that we are the whole reason we're going to cloud is because we want to alleviate and make our people more efficient, yet we're going to have hundreds of pods to manage that you've just broken your entire value proposition. So oh, go ahead, Mark. I was just going to say, you know, OpenStack can only solve some of these problems. One of the, I mean, until there's like infinite, you know, beyond the speed of light networking, like you have to know how to design a production large scale network first to be able to even address the potential to take software that can virtualize that environment and orchestrate that environment. So OpenStack's not anywhere close to solving that problem. That's not really any directly in its domain yet. There's, you need smart people to do that. Um, but I think there's the, the, the frustration with OpenStack and the scale need is that there's, you kind of have, right now, you have to roll your own. Like cloud scaling did it on their own with something that wasn't really necessarily put back upstream. Um, and the companies that are doing it now, they have smart people, they got PhDs kind of figuring out how to extend the, the clusters so that they're performant and the MySQLs so that they're performant. Fundamentally, it's all backed by an interpreted language that, that's going to be more costly uh, just in terms of dealing with all of that traffic. And now at this conference, I'm starting to hear, oh, well, we should probably let people start contributing into compiled languages like Java. I'm like, well, didn't we already do that? Like, that works. So, sorry, a little frustration there. And then changing the gears a little bit, I think that if we ignore application scalability, we're ignoring like the whole point of why we're building up scalable cloud infrastructures. It's also very hard to build scalable apps. And so that, that shift that we're seeing, that we are promoting and driving of hyperscale, I'm gonna use that buzzword, of systems that can, uh, infrastructure that can grow massively must be coordinated with applications that can grow massively. More cloud native, cloud aware, whatever, whatever term you wanna use, there's a huge application component there as well. Any other questions? Yeah, can you, can you uh, do the mic? Did you mind? Just behind you. So Dan and I have talked about this a little bit before, and you actually anticipated my question, but um, a lot of the discussions about scale that I hear are really, you know, they can be loosely translated in, well, we'll build it, and then they'll just show up. And, um, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of been a theme for, with OpenStack for, you know, the four or five years I've been involved in it. Um, I'm wondering if you guys can talk some more about Dan's point about how do you engage the application side in, you know, building those things. I mean, do you wait for them to show up and say, okay, I think I want to do this on Docker and containers, but uh, you know, uh, can I get a bigger budget for uh, running on AWS? And then you say no, and then you start talking. Or is it, um, you know, or you just happen to show up one day and said, "Did you know what you could do?" And they say, "Well, we never thought about that." Can you guys talk about that a little bit more in terms of engaging them? I mean, it comes from the business side. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the first crack, and I'll be quick. I know I can be long-winded. I know exactly. Uh, I, it, honestly, like this is probably my number one passion area across everything I do in my day-to-day -day job. I I have uh, messed this up so many times already uh, that that you know for, you know in full disclosure when when I first started uh, and we, this is you know er, uh, uh, before 2010 and we were looking at VCD and we were building up what were versions of clouds like we built those as infrastructure solutions and then we were shocked that when we built it they didn't come. Uh, and then I did it again and messed up. I didn't, like my team, uh, as, a, as a leader of the team, it's my responsibility, so I, that's why I take the responsibility there. But we did it again. We built an HP cloud solution that was not optimal, uh, but that was a separate discussion. But that we, again, we thought we would build it, and we'd build it better this time. And then, because obviously the barrier to them coming on was we didn't, it wasn't good enough. Uh, and again, they didn't come. Uh, you know, iterate, iterate, iterate. We're at the point now where the OpenStack solution we're building, as as interesting it is, we are not gaining as much success. We're, we're trying different ideas, I'll, I'll be honest. We're not gaining as much success having enterprise-wide 
decisions that are, we will do blah, right? Because we're too big of a company to have that enterprise-wide, we will do blah, because we don't have the ability to show proof positive data that it will be as successful as we are claiming it would be. If we were a small company and there were 10 of us and we could rally around and get around it, absolutely. But there are you know, five, 600 of us in the technology organization and to shift that Titanic is not possible. So instead what we're doing is we're grabbing the connectors that are in our dev partners and the people that have a lot of weight and, and when they say something, everybody else is like, oh, that must be truth. We're grabbing those people and really dedicating and investing time in those people and getting them amped and hyped and using them as our evangelists, for lack of a better term, to move out and throughout the rest of the dev organization to show the wins that can be accomplished by changing the way they develop and then also doing that on, on our cloud stack. The, so that I've also been the built it and they didn't come. So the strategies I had to overcome that was actually as, so A, I was lucky. Look, uh, to that, the company Zynga was founded in 2007, so there was no legacy apps, right? All of the developers were needing and wanting to code in very modern automated deployment uh, ways. So that was a great culture in which to succeed, but still building Z Cloud after everybody was happy in Amazon, uh, I had the, the built it and they did not come problem. So again, I also found an early willing adopter who was, we, we were the first successful to kind of align on the uh, chargeback model where they weren't profitable, they needed to get profitable. Building Z Cloud enabled us to provide a uh, twice as performant and a third the cost environment to do exactly what they were doing in Amazon fronted by a, a multi-cloud orchestration tool that effectively let them pull a drop-down down and, and have a different way to deploy uh, on a cheaper and better infrastructure. And what that evangelism story turned out to be is not only was it cheaper and as performant, it was better. The user experience was better because the CPUs were richer in the environment that I had compared to what Amazon was running. Uh, so that's one. Most, now, now that Amazon's pricing has come down significantly, since I did this in, in 2011, um, it's now harder to kind of you know, prove that, and especially at a smaller scale, that your new private cloud is going to be cheaper than Amazon. But what I would suggest, if, if this is the, the place that your company needs to be investing and to needs to encourage its, your internal customers to be consuming, is you subsidize the chargeback. A, you should do chargeback. B, you might have to subsidize it to encourage uh, the, those customers to consume it more quickly and you absolutely have to have the evangelist and you have to have them involved in the design. So one of the, the greatest thing, you know, again, it's a hard thing for an IT person to feel like somebody else can have good ideas about what to do with our infrastructure. But I'll tell you, involving my customer was critical. The, the first experience was taking them into the data center and they, they saw all the space in the racks. Well, can't we put more servers in there? No, I mean, you educate them about power, you educate them about cooling and the limits of, of the realities of data centers. One of the greatest kind of contributions from my developer community um, or customer was that we were building out Z Cloud and we had different sized um, data center buildings. And so we were worried about availability zone size um, equality and a very simple suggestion of can't you divide it horizontally and make a top half and a bottom half availability zone split at the middle of the rack. And that was like the perfect solution that we just had not thought of and involving your customers just great wins and they feel great to be able to contribute to it. Yeah. <clears throat> Isn't it cheating to subsidize the, uh, the chargeback? Not if, this is not the not if you've you paid for two, <laughs> so if you've, if you've spent millions of dollars and there's no usage there. You know, Zynga for a long time was saying, oh, we're deploying apps in Amazon, then we know what they are, then we move them. Well, once you've built enough capacity that's unused, you know, it was, it was about four months we were actually doing that, but then things would go directly into Z Cloud because A, it was better. We had proven that finally with early customers, and C or B, it was uh, um, empty <laughs> and so cheaper, and, and it, was, it just made sense to go there. So, uh, ha having been on the vendor side, I've seen a lot of uh, IT departments build out an OpenStack or some other private cloud and, and kind of offer it, and then have very little, uh, very little adoption. Um, generally, generally what, uh, what, what's done, well basically there's a fundamental shift in how IT spends decided and the developer is king and the developer kind of you know, decides where, where to place you know, his or her workload. And, uh, and so the approach that I've seen work uh, is basically for a corporate IT to basically set, a set, of, you know, set up a set of guardrails, like uh, we will do chargeback, we will do uh, like, you know, auditing and logging, we will do all these things setting up all the, the, the guardrails, and then offer a portfolio of clouds to the, uh, to the user to, to use. 
Um, and uh, that's one of the reasons that we've, we've uh, that Scalera has built a lot of policy and, and governance uh, uh, capability is to be able to, to, to set up those guardrails to help uh, do the chargebacks and all that. Um, and then it's up to the user and, and the internal customer to decide where you know, he or she wants to place the workload. Um, and, uh, and then you kind of just grow things from there. So, uh, you know, uh, if I actually, uh, I think Sebastian raised a really good point, which is really developer. At the end of the day, it is, uh, the, the, you know, at some point, the, 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 the adoption has to really come from developers. Uh, you know, OpenStack, I always thought OpenStack had a great developer traction, but it turned out, um, I mean, they're probably more like in the developer builder category as opposed to the developer, you know, application writer or developer user category. So I think that, that area we definitely have some more work to do. And it's, uh, it's not easy. And, and, and that's honestly, uh, I struggled with that for a long time with, uh, with cloud stack. You know, we, we built hundreds of clouds and they were all in production years ago. And, and I would say, you know, not all of them really took off like Zynga did. Many of them just, just died. So it's really not good enough to make your system scalable, easy to deploy, easy to maintain. And, and if they, in the end, if there's no adoption, uh, uh, they're not successful. So, uh, so that's, on, at the end, of that's what actually got me into, into Docker. And then I was really happy to see uh, the focus on containers on the second day keynote, a lot of talk about that. And it's really not about uh, so the containers replacing virtual machine. I don't think that's going to happen. It'll, it'll, I think it'll run as a workload on virtual machines. But, but also, it, it's, just a, it's just a great uh, workload for, for uh, uh, platforms like, uh, you know, like, like, like OpenStack to take up. And, and I think you know, in, the, in the coming years, uh, the more OpenStack can, uh, can do to, to enable uh, great workloads like Docker containers, I mean, the better position we'll all be in. There'll be, there'll be more adoption. <laughs> Good question. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Sure. Um, thanks for doing this, by the way. Um, you sort of touched on this a moment ago with your mentioning of containers inside of virtual machines, and there are various opinions about that. So my question to all of you is, are we building out virtual machine infrastructure, which will be obsoleted by uh, bare metal containers in a short period of time? So, yes, yeah, so, so it's, it's a heterogeneous world out there. I mean, like mainframes are still running. Uh, yeah, the, the, it is quite possible that the private clouds being built today are just going to be obsolete tomorrow. And, uh, but that's kind of just a reality of the, the industry. I mean. IBM still makes you know, billions of dollars of selling Z, uh, the, what's it called, the Z series? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, mainframe. Uh, so yeah, it, it, uh, most, comp most companies have both EMC and NetApp. They have Juniper and Cisco, and it's just a very, very heterogeneous world out there. Yeah, I think the, the legacy spectrum of applications are still going to be very dependent on a hypervisor type of approach. And if I think about the ideal world of what I deploy containers on hypervisors and orchestrate kind of both and one inside the other, I would prefer not to do that. Just again, simplicity scales. And I always think about when it's broken, how many things do I have to eliminate before I have found root cause and can fix it? Because meantime, I'm burning people's, uh, I'm stressing people out, we're losing money. Again, I would try as, as, uh, as much as possible to have containers running on simple OS on bare metal, orchestrating them differently than inside a hypervisor. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think um, a virtual machine will go away. So I've heard basically two arguments that say uh, why containers will replace virtual machines. One is there will be no need for virtual machines. Containers run on bare metal servers. Um, the other is uh, containers in the future will be better isolated, so containers will work like virtual machines. Right. So those are basically two arguments people people talk about. And I think the first one it ha uh, Container running on bare metal server, it's, it's, certainly, uh, it's certainly possible. I know people who do it today. But I think for me, uh, from my perspective, that's a, that's a bit of a corner case. Just like bare metal cloud, it's, it's out there, but, you know, but it's not AWS. Uh, it's, so so um, 
the, the, the fact is the machines are becoming so much more powerful. Their, their capacity is doubling you know, on a continuing basis. And as I said, what kind of people who, the kind of people who like containers actually tend to be developers. And, and it's just inconceivable that, that, that in a development environment, CICD environment, you, know, you, would, you, you, would, pro, you would actually provision uh, a bare metal machine to a developer as a unit of provision, then it's just too big for a developer to consume. The, 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 the other part, container is now going to grow up and, and, and have really good isolation. You know, I, you know, I think I see great things like LXD, I mean, certainly kind of going that way, but I think it's really got a long way to go. You know, the, 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 the attack surface, the, 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 the security boundary of virtual machine is just so much cleaner, so much better understood. Than, uh, than the entire Linux kernel. So um, uh, it could get there, but you know, I'm one of these guys who honestly uh, have trouble uh, uh, understanding some of the uh, uh, container. Uh, you know, I've been doing containers for a couple of years now, and these days I still, like every time I try to run a Docker on, on say, uh, on CentOS and Red Hat, uh, these guys are very security conscious, did tons of work, but it, it just really um, uh, uh, slowed me down. So a lot of times I just end up running with SE Linux disabled. I know I'm not supposed to do that, but it, it shows me how much gap there really is. Right? I couldn't even get it to work with, with some of the security mechanisms in place. So I'm going to give a little bit of a uh, different perspective. Like I, I see this, and I know this doesn't answer your question because your question is probably more philosophical, but this is Coke versus Pepsi. This is Chevy versus uh, Ford. This is Asian versus white food, right? Of course. Uh, no, seriously. So, But from that standpoint, I, I, we are going to continue to have containers and VMs, and it's going to be personal preference, and one may kind of uh, move to the front. Like we have people still using CloudStack and OpenStack, one may have more hype right now. I think we'll have one more, more hype, but I think that ultimately what will be driven comes all the way back to this conversation about scale, and that is what is easiest and most simplistic for you to scale to meet the business need. And you may have someone, like I, for us, like I, I, for me it's people, it's always people. And you may have people that say, you know what, I think I can manage this environment much better if I have the containers running on a, some type of VM or, you know, versus running directly on hardware or bare metal. I think that's better for me. Uh, and if that is what the team believes and is able to support that in a better way, far be it from me uh, to come back and say, no, I, philosophically I believe that it is better to provision bare metal and run containers on it. So it's, it's going to be, I think, for a while, personal opinion. And then that personal opinion, I'll let the, the people who are leading uh, the technical charge on my team drive that decision. So I've got a question that I want to kind of go down the panel, uh, or actually just to want you guys to, to answer something. What's the biggest kind of disaster you guys have seen in, you know, kind of hyperscale or scaling out? And then what was that lesson learned? We, Shen, do you have something? Yeah, no, I, 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 you know, I certainly remember some of the very difficult upgrades we went through in the in, in the early years. Um, uh, you know, it d definitely involved uh, us learning in a very painful way that a large-scale system just cannot be um, uh, upgraded in one shot. It, you, you know, you you had to create canaries. You had to make sure the individual components. Um, would actually work, and, and you an inevitably end up in a situation where, where part of the system is running in one version of the software, another part of the system is running in another version of the software. So, um, uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't think, by the way, these challenges have gone away yet. It, it, it's still today, you know, the, 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 the dream of a, of a fully autonomous self-upgrading, you know, a loosely coupled kind of architecture is, is just really still uh, does not exist, regardless of you know what kind of, I mean, you could use Kubernetes or use whatever, it's, it's, it's just really still the same. And, and, and I've seen at the end of the day, it still requires operators, the uh, operations team, DevOps team, who deeply understands the, the behavior of, of the entire app and the individual components to, to, to sit it through. Um, not necessarily at a huge scale, like tens of thousands of machines, but still reasonable scale. Uh, I, I saw an open stack where a single call to list instances resulted in 700, 700 uh, selects to MySQL, or 700 uh, queries to MySQL. Uh, and, and in that environment, uh, you know, when, when we were just making very simple, uh, we have a desired state engine, when we were just comparing observed state with you know, our desired state, 
we were just making a couple API calls to figure out what volumes are out there, what instances are out there. And that was just massively overwrite, uh, over subscribing, uh, overloading the database. And uh, yeah, that's just you know, a disaster. So my, one of my experiences, several outages, uh, but the earliest ones when we were in Amazon were just so excruciating because my mindset and the mindset of, of how I would want to consume infrastructure was that in Amazon I want that whole data center to not go down. And that happened repeatedly. And when you looked at the SLA and you're saying, oh, well, the entire ha half of the region can go down without any kind of credit, it, it's acutely frustrating. But it forced a change in behavior because how important that infrastructure was to the business. It, it forced the change in, in maturity of the application so that it could be actually fault tolerant between availability zones and that with every outage, we got better at maintaining availability and, and preserving state and recovering from state and building that automation. And once you do that, it's, you can perform, your workload can then run anywhere. You're so much more bulletproof and, and able to move it back. And that made it even easier for us to then move things to zCloud because of that investment. I think it's an interesting question from the standpoint of, uh, like, I, I'm sure all of us in this room have had one server go down uh, and cause application impact. That really is no different than at massive scale having an outage. The only difference is level of impact, right? It's, if, it's way different if you are, like, the federal health care system, the U.S. federal health care system that's going down versus, you know, maybe a, a very small, like, baseball trading card company or something. But the reality is it's the exact same problem. And it comes back to exactly what Mark was saying, like, have you developed thinking around and have you built your application thinking around anything here can fail? Uh, and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna use a cop out. I think the biggest outages we've had, not in size, uh, the biggest outages we've had in size are for sure caused by change. When we either upgrade, roll something, do something, et cetera. That's guaranteed the largest scaling outage. But the longest duration, biggest pain in the ass, most frustrating, most challenging to our teams, demoralizing, et cetera, and this is the cop out, are usually bugs. Uh, it's a buffer credit issue on a fiber channel network. It is some, the whole Google, uh, the GCE outage that happened, you know, around that networking stack, right? It is, we had a challenge, you mentioned yesterday a challenge with firmware. We had a challenge with a very specific piece of firmware uh, that was doing something that was just a bug, and we happened to be the first one to hit it. We've had firmwares on the uh, global load balancer issues, right? We, you have them, and they're so hard to find because in, in a true open source type model, you're like, I mostly trust this, but I'm gonna go to the community and make sure it's right, and I, I gotta be a little bit careful, whatever. But if, as you've, like, for a load balancer or something, or a Cisco router, every, everyone here I'm sure has had challenges like that, you almost expect them to operate correctly. And when VRRP doesn't, and it's, do, and it's passing traffic through both nodes for whatever reason, and you're like, it says it's ha healthy, like, that is really hard to find. And so, rather than trying to say, I will fix every piece of infrastructure, or in OpenStack, I will make OpenStack completely resilient. Uh, there was a really great session yesterday on Pacemaker, which we must do as, obviously, as the providers of that underlying infrastructure. But at the same time, we can't rely on that. We have to build application stacks so, to be so more resilient. One little note on, on that is, like, at, at some point, you're going to have to make some assumptions on something that's going to be available. Um, like, you, like on Amazon, uh, you, uh, at some point, EBS volumes got corrupted, and you know, right. they disappeared, or, or like, I mean, like, if you start out by saying, hey, anything can happen, meteorites can fall in my data center and take out North America, then, like, if you start, like, having absolutely zero assumptions on what's going to remain available, it becomes really hard to make uh, large-scale infrastructure. Yeah. Yes, there's a, there's a but, right? And the but is it's totally based around, like, level of impact. So yeah. If, yeah, totally, if, yeah. if the cost of that impact of that outage, to your point, is $50, well, that decision that you make around what you're going to assume will be available will be pretty much everything. Well, I'll just assume it's available, right? Because I, I can't make any other decisions. Spot on. Yeah. But if the impact is, you know, fifty million dollars, then you should spend, you know, multiply that by some risk weighting and spend that on making it available. So you, yeah, good exactly, yeah. exactly. Well, the the microservice. Oh, well, we'll get you. The, 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 I know the microservices are, are are very popular, and it's about kind of small, lightweight, distributed. I mean, maybe we're onto something in OpenStack where it's kind of like micro infrastructure. We have very, lots of small pods and distributed, maybe it's built like, we don't even know we're are, doing are that. Are you trying to spin I'm, the deficiencies I'm, right now? I'm, <laughs> yes, I think we're spinning it as, as very fault tolerant. Yes, many, extremely. Many availability zones. Uh, what, what, what's your question, sir? Uh, hi, uh, if any one of you has, some of you can address this. Uh, so, so far, this is my first summit, by the way, it's been great, thank you. 
Um, so far, all the conversations and the discussions that I've had, people have been talking about OpenStack, and everybody seems to say it's still new, it's still nascent, it's growing, there's still a lot of things to be worked out, etc. cetera. Uh, you guys obviously have a lot of experience with running production clouds and large ones of them. Can you speak to what are the challenges you've faced in ensuring that the data for your applications remains coherent and is consistent, and what steps you've taken to keep data available while you upgrade your open stack or your cloud stack, and how have you ensured that you've not lost that? So I come that's from a financial a company background. Question. We have time for a, Sorry. we have time for no answer. We are time. Yeah, come see us, come yeah. see us after. We want to thank the panel, thank Shin, Sebastian, Mark, and Dan. Uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, enjoy the rest of the, the conference. Cheers. Cheers.